of the amazing things that we could do with our Amigas back in the day was to emulate a Macintosh. Now in a previous episode I showed you how you could emulate an IBM PC, but uh, not very well. Uh, software emulation was terribly slow and uh, you could use hardware emulation with a sidecar, but that was clunky and expensive. However, emulating a Macintosh was a very different story. You see, the Amiga and the Macintosh both used the Motorola 68000 CPU. In fact, you could actually pop the CPU out of your Amiga and put it in your Macintosh and it would work just fine, or vice versa. Thus, the Amiga didn't need to emulate the CPU, which made everything run much faster. In fact, this would be more of what we'd call a virtual machine than an emulation. However, uh, there were two barriers uh, making it difficult to run Mac software on your Amiga. Uh, one problem was that the floppy drive in the Amiga was not capable of reading Macintosh format. Uh, the second problem was that Apple owned the rights to the ROMs and weren't about to license that. Especially when you consider that a Mac Plus cost a whopping $2,599 in 1987, and an Amiga 500 cost $699. Uh, basically, the Mac cost 3.7 times as much money. So, a couple years later, one third-party product that came to market was called Amax, and uh, they had a hardware solution to both problems. Uh, let's open up the box and have a look. Um, here's the user's guide. Here's the product. And um, I'll show you what this peg does in a minute. Um, and it comes with these two discs. On the inside of the unit, you'll find two ROM chips. Now, notice these are actual Apple branded ROMs. Now, these were pulled from a real Macintosh at some point, uh, so the user had to supply their own ROM chips from a Mac, or I suppose they could burn their own copy. Either way, it uh, indemnified a Mac from any copyright problems. Oh, and on the inside of the case, you'll find the signatures of the developers. So. The way this works is it plugs into the Amiga's floppy drive port and then you can connect an official Apple disk drive. Now this solves the problem with not being able to read Macintosh disks. And I promise to show you what this peg does. Uh, well you can pull this little one out and uh, replace it with the longer one. And that way when you use it on the Amiga 1000 it sits at the right height. So uh, let's boot it up and see what we get. If we take a look at the video preferences, you'll notice there are a number of options, such as high res or interlaced. And uh, of course, we can pick the size of the Macintosh screen. Now for best compatibility with a Mac Plus, uh, you'd want the 512 by 384. However, this does present a small problem. Uh, one of the issues you have to deal with is the difference of screen resolution. Uh, Mac Plus, for example, had a screen resolution of 512 by 384, but the Amiga was usually 640 by 200. And a lot of that difference boils down to the fact that the Macintosh had square pixels and the Amiga had rectangular shaped pixels. So if you were to compare this with square pixels, the Amiga screen would look like this. And um, if you tried to overlay the Mac screen, as you can see, it won't quite fit. Uh, one option is to use a virtual screen that you can scroll around on like this. But uh, this is not a very elegant way of doing things. So the better option is to use interlace mode, which doubles the Amiga's vertical resolution. However, this causes a problem I didn't really anticipate trying to demonstrate this in a video. So while this may look like it's working fine, the camera is only picking up a single field. And so every other line on the screen appears to be missing. And for example, a look at the menu bar of the control panel. Now normally it has a pattern of alternating lines, but when I move it around it will appear all black or all white, depending on whether it lands on an even or odd pixel. Uh, now it doesn't look like this way in person, it's just on camera. Now you might say, well David, film it in 60 FPS and that will solve that. Well, it does, sort of, but then I get this huge black bar on the screen. <laughs> so I thought maybe I could capture video from the Amiga using HDMI. Well, this kind of looks okay, but there are bizarre artifacts anywhere that there's motion. Uh, so then I thought, hey, we're dealing with black and white anyway, why not capture from my Amiga 500's black and white composite port? So I tried that and I have to tell my capture device how to handle the interface and uh, this example was telling it to blur the fields which doesn't look so great. Now this example uh, using Weave it looks decent at times but the uh, capture device keeps losing sync. So then I had an idea. What if I use this old Apple III green screen monitor? It uses long persistence phosphor, uh, which was meant to reduce flicker. And uh, lo and behold, uh, this thing works perfectly and makes my camera very happy. <laughs> and of course, uh, through the magic of video editing, I could make this screen look black and white, just like the Macintosh. So what I'm gonna do now is insert a Mac OS 608 disc into both machines here and see how long it takes each to boot. 
It turns out the Mac actually wins by a couple of seconds, but it also has more RAM than my Amiga, so who knows. Now, but there isn't much difference. Anyway, once booted, I can literally just stick in any Macintosh software, uh, such as Mac Draw, uh, not to be confused with Mac Paint. <laughs> uh, this was a vector style uh, drawing program, and um, I don't know how to use it, so I'm just going to use some of the uh, example drawings. Okay, so uh, let's try some of the classic software like Mac Paint. Uh, we used to have this on our Macs back in high school. Seems to work just fine. And of course, we have to try Claris McWrite. I used to use this in the writing lab at high school probably once a week. And well, it seems to work just fine. So how about something more interesting like Tetris? And here we go. Even the sound appears to be working correctly. Let's try playing a game. I mean, this works totally perfectly. I mean, it's kind of surreal feeling playing Macintosh Tetris on my Amiga 500. Now, to be fair, you might pose this question. Why would you bother to do this, being you could play the Amiga version of Tetris, which is in color and generally better? Well, you probably wouldn't. This is more of a party trick, I think. <laughs> I mean, nobody's going to want to run Mac games on their Amiga. I'm sure the idea behind this was to run the various business software like Excel, PageMaker, and stuff like that. But I don't have any of those to show you, so I figure I'll just show you more games as examples of compatibility. So I wanted to talk about speed here for a moment. Uh, I ran a number of programs side by side with the Mac Plus, and as you can see, there's no discernible difference. I realize this isn't the same as a benchmarking program, but uh, I didn't really know for sure what to run. But even if there is some difference, clearly it is minor and doesn't affect the experience at all. Let's talk about disk formats for a moment. So I've been booting Mac OS from my internal Amiga drive. And yet I said earlier that the Amiga drive couldn't read Macintosh formats. However, uh, Amax has its own format that contains the Apple file system but uses timing that's compatible with the Amiga's drive. And uh, so what you can do is copy files or entire disks from the Apple external drive over to the Amiga's drive. So you could actually copy all of your Macintosh software over to Amax formatted floppy disk. You could also copy the ROM chips over to disk as well, creating a completely software only solution. In fact, that's what I have running right here. This is just a stock Amiga 500, a uh, regular Amiga floppy drive. There's no Amex cartridge connected, no ROMs, no Apple floppy drive. Um, unless of course you count the Apple monitor, but <laughs> clearly you could use the Amiga monitor if you wanted to. The point is, this is the setup that I had back in um, the early 90s, and uh, I had a pirated copy of Amax along with uh, several Amax formatted disks that contain various Macintosh software that I could play around with. Oh, and there is another option for copying files from a real Mac to your Amiga. If you use the utilities disk on a real Mac, you have the option to create a special kind of transfer disk. Now, I'll explain how I think this works. Um, I think due to the way Mac and Amiga drives read data at different speeds depending upon what track they're on, I think there's a common area of the disk that is readable by both systems. And so what they've done is divided the disk up into a Mac format here, Amiga format over here, and some sort of weird hybrid format in the middle uh, that's only readable by this software. Um, and that section is 272K. So you can only copy stuff a little bit at a time. The utility allows you to create three such disks to copy a full disk image from uh, one machine to another. Kind of a pain, but it does eliminate the need for a Macintosh drive. Of course, Amax also supports the use of hard drives uh, so that you could create like a custom Apple partition and you could do considerably more complex tasks. I don't have any of that equipment to show you at the moment, but I've actually seen that kind of thing in operation, especially like on Amiga 2000s and uh, uh, later model Amigas. Speaking of the 2000, there was also an internal card you could get uh, that had the Amax ROMs on it and the floppy drive port and an Apple Talk 
network connection so you could actually network with other Macintosh computers. So uh, that would have been pretty cool. I don't have one of those to show, but uh, I also wanted to talk about something else. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, footage here. Now, this is, believe it or not, this is my actual high school writing lab where we had a lot of Mac Pluses. And uh, this was actually taken in 1995, so this was two years after I graduated. Uh, but the uh, it looks exactly the same. Like <laughs> other than the students occupying the seats, uh, the writing lab looks looked exactly like that uh, when I was in high school. And I so you know I had to go in and use one of these every day. And a lot of the other students in the class had never used a computer before, and so they were really thought that these computers were really cool. And uh, they would rave on and on about them. And of course. You know, this irritated me a bit because I had one of these at home that could do amazing things. And I would try to explain to my fellow classmates that, hey, you know, these are okay, but what you really want is an Amiga because, you know, it's not only a third of the price, but it can, you know, do all this great graphics and sound and all this kind of stuff. And they weren't really grasping it. Uh, and I didn't really have any way to show them most of the time unless I invited them over to my house. And uh, even then, they would always be like, well, there must be some reason that the Macintosh is so much more expensive. There's bound to be things that it can do that the Amiga can't. And so um, I liked the fact that Amax existed because I could honestly say to them that, you know what, that's not true. Um, the Amiga quite literally can do anything a Macintosh can do and you know so much more. Now, whether I ever actually convinced anybody <laughs> I don't know, but it was at least a nice argument to have in your back pocket. But that about wraps it up for this episode. I would like to remind everybody that uh, I do participate in the Geek Bits podcast. We uh, release a, a new episode like you know, once or twice a month, and uh, it's worth checking out if you're into geeky stuff. We talk about Star Trek and science fiction and physics stuff and all, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but anyway, that's it for this episode. As always, thanks for watching.